My name is Christian Basil. Years ago, I had an idea. I got myself a TARDIS. Took it to new places, met a lot of new people, took some great pictures, and talked Doctor Who. From Krypton Radio and the creators of the Hanging With web show, this is the legend of the traveling TARDIS. Join me on my latest adventures and become part of the legend. So, Mackenzie, you're going to get a kick out of this. I did not have to reboot my computer, not once, not twice, but three times oh, no. to get things started. <laughs> Holy cow. I'm just like, what is wrong with you, Windows, whatever you are now? Windows, what are we up to Windows? Like Windows 12 or some weird nonsense like that? I don't know. Anyway, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of The Legend of the Traveling Tardis. My name is Christian Basil. I am the host of the show. And today, we will be interviewing some special guests today. Uh, you probably haven't heard of this book, but we're going to be, by the time of this end of the episode, you're going to understand it not only well, but you're going to probably buy it, and we're hoping that you will buy it, because this is going to be an awesome book, as you can see on the screen, A World of Demons, The Villains of Doctor Who, written by Ken Deep, and you know what? I'm going to just introduce the guests out here. Hang on one second. Let me pull off the screen. ba -doom. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody, for your happy holidays, we are celebrating the 25 days of Humus over on our Facebook page. Don't forget to subscribe and uh, follow us on the Facebook page. We're at 64,000, and hoping by the end of this year, we're going to be at 65,000 right at the, uh, the end of this year out there. And right now, if you haven't already, go ahead, like, share, subscribe, and subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com. Slash the Legend of the Traveling Tardis. Our goal was to hit 2,500 by the end of this year, and you guys surpassed that. We're at 2,550. So, you know what? I'm greedy. So, let's go for 3,000. Let's do it. Let's go for a million. I'm totally greedy out here. So, welcome there. And let me go ahead and introduce our panel guest for today. We're going to start off. You heard her voice just earlier. The lovely Mackenzie Floor. And what do we say, Mackenzie? What do we say when we got that going out there? What do you got? What do you got? Cat Cattling Cat Tardis, Cat Alert, and uh, Hannah and, and Ken will absolutely know what that means at the end of this episode. Uh, basically, anytime one of our panelists has a cat crawling on the screen, we've got the Cat Alert coming. Mackenzie, how are you doing? I'm doing good. And this is pause for those who are wondering. This is oh, camera shy. <laughs> It's just not, doing? she's just right now a little bit. <laughs> what am I doing? What am I doing right here? Oh, mom, don't let that say them. <laughs> oh, I see another I saw the tail of another. Good grief. <laughs> and I've got a pesty fly, a single pesty fly that's flying around my camera. And you have a flea that nice. flew in your, in your house and it's just, oh gosh, don't <laughs> Well, folks, I want to introduce our special guest today and we want to show you uh, as you saw in the title, a uh, very special book, A World of Demons, uh, The Villains of Doctor Who, and our contributors are right here. But first of all, let me start off with the lovely Hannah Friedman. Hannah, how are you doing today? Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. It's great to be here. I love your background. I love the non-frills tree. I like it. And that's not an insult. No, I like it's, yeah, it's, it's very less simple. is like, more. This is, this is my Jewish Christmas tree. I haven't set oh, up my okay. menorah yet. I'm waiting for Thursday. Okay. But you know, it's it's just it's an excuse to have lights. No, I love I love Christmas lights. I love a good Christmas light show there. Hannah, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you are involved with uh with this book. Uh well, I wrote um I contributed an, a chapter to um A World of Demons. I contributed a chapter on um the Silence in the Library and Forest of the Dead episodes from the David Tennant portion of the series. Um, and in the rest of my life, I'm a writer. I mostly write about addiction and mental health. So it was oh. interesting to sort of use those skills to write about something completely different for once. And this is my first time being published in a physical book, although I've been published online and uh, online a great deal. This is a first oh. time. So oh, wow. Fun. Well, congratulations. How's it feel yeah. to be like, we got, we got, our, we got our stuff out there? Amazing. It really amazing. I'm really proud of this one and really just so delighted to be sharing the space with so many other great writers and so many other exciting ideas. 
And don't forget, uh, if you want to join in on the conversation, by all means, if you have your questions about the book or if you got anything for Hannah and Ken in just a few minutes, really introducing Ken, please join up live. Uh, just type in. Don't forget, if you're on this, uh, if you haven't signed up for the stream yard yet, make sure that you sign up and put your name in there. Oh, wow. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just somebody came into the studio and I don't know if they want to be seen or not. So I'm going to keep them off track for just a little bit there. Speaking of keeping things off track, uh, because I am just so great with segues. Ken knows that so well. Mr. Ken Deep of L.I.U. Hey. How are you doing there, sir? How are you? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining thank us. You, sir. Ken. Uh, Paul, everyone, Christian, you and Mackenzie as well. Thanks for, for having us. And it's it's it, I was laughing a little bit and my, my mic was was muted, but I was laughing when you said right. that uh, oh, the author of the book, and I'm like, there's 16 of us. Oh, that's true. Well, you know, well, technically, you're all the authors, or the, yeah. the authors of the that's book. True. Yeah. That's true. It is probably 10 or 11 of the greatest pages in literary history. Oh, uh, if I'm not there, we go. Mm. there. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> just, I, mean, so I dumped into the stream and it, it changed the layout. Oh, good grief! There. Put it back to solo. Sorry, you go no back, there. back to you again, Dave. Can you take I, I over? Never, but you know. Can you take on the chats That's there, Dave? Guess. I can try and take on the chats. Yes, you got it there, my friend. Thank you, uh, Ken. What was what was that? The cactus? Yeah, that's Meglos behind me. Let's see if. Oh, I'm okay. Gotcha. That's um. Yeah, that's that Meglos in all his glory, left over from the convention uh, a couple weeks ago. Just put some curly hair on him. We'll call him Tom Baker. I like it. Already, you know, I. There. After seeing um, Hannah's Christmas tree, I thought I should have put lights on it. It's not too late. I put yeah, cap. for like some festive, you know, yeah, a, a, the festive season. Some bulbs. Mm -hmm. Happy, happy megalos to everyone out there. Yes. Is that a thing now? Is that like ha is that like uh, what was it? Uh, happy Life Day from Star Wars. Happy Megalos Day. Right. Yeah, we just well, we just created our own holiday uh, at the convention. I mean, you know, why not? We're Doctor Who fans. You can do whatever Very we want. Thing. Right. And don't forget, uh, be in the chat there if you have your questions for Hannah, Ken, myself, the lovely Dave Chapman. You know what? I'm just going to throw it in there. How are you doing there, Dave? How did, uh, <laughs> apparently, I have no idea how I'm doing, apparently. Mel Melanie is on her way to take care of things, but I'm glad you came in here. I appreciate it there, pal. I, Thank uh, you so much. Love the hat. Yes, I, I am in the process. The plan was to get home into Red Deer and get set up for my uh, my Christmas set sooner. Oh my god! So I, I but I've not had a chance to do that, and uh, so I'm, I've just kind of threw my laptop up and was like, "Okay, great, here we go." I don't know why you just. Well, I know why you reminded me of this. I was at a convention just recently called Krampus Con, and yes. our friend Daniel was out there with Dalek Hal and Ren, and I, yes. But no, I got a better picture. I got a better picture of that. There you oh, go. <laughs> nice. Very festive. And just for all the kids, just to scare them the heck out of there, we'll oh. send Krampus and the Dalek after. <laughs> nice. Don't be naughty, kids. Don't be naughty. So. I was, I was uh, yesterday was Krampus knock, and I was wearing my Krampus sweater, but it is upstairs somewhere because I took it off. <laughs> I, I don't even have my I don't even have a Quidditch jersey on today. Like that's how not prepared I am. That's okay. I'm not prepared either. I was uh, I three times, three times I had to reboot the computer, three times, and I just like you know after the third time I'm just like you know I'm about to go to cell phone and finally just finally kicked up on there. Um, I'm, I'm waiting <laughs> for the extremely slow. Computer. So I, I I don't know what it is. It's, it's computer issues today. A festive cactus. Okay. Yeah, Hashtag you your next to your uh, computer, like I have, gaming computer, streaming computer. Yeah. Gotcha. It's great. <laughs> so without further ado, um, you know what? Let's go to a commercial break. Let's go to a commercial break. And when we return, Ken, Anna, we're going to be talking to you about your new book, uh, which everybody can see here. Let me go ahead and pull up the banner. No, no, I'm going to do one better. I got a lovely picture, and then I've got a robot with it. <laughs> ah. uh, the World of Demons, uh, the Villains of Doctor Who, and uh, been edited by David Bushman and Barnaby Edwards. Not the one that you think. Sorry, I, I asked that same question out there. So when we return, please continue to stay logged on, tuned in, and become part of the legend. Commercial break. Here we go.
Oh, brilliant! It's hard to believe that in the 56 year history of the greatest sci-fi television show in the English language, there has never been a fan guide to Doctor Who. The official books might give you what they think you need to know, but only a guide written by a true fan will give you what you really want to know. Join Whovian, the brilliant Mackenzie Floor, as she takes you on an intensive journey inside the world of the first female Doctor. In the Binge Watcher's Guide to Doctor Who, Season 11. Right, let's get a shift on. We are touring. We are we are a touring acoustic duo crashing kitchens around the country. We go from house to house every Friday night and we create music, we create food, a good time, we stream it live and we do it for free. So now we're just really kind of like trying to develop it and build a community group that people believe in, then they'll help us. So we played from our rehearsal room, we played from the bathroom, thankfully that didn't catch on. I probably played guitar in my room, not for anyone, in front of anyone, nobody heard, for probably about 10 years. And then one Friday night, we played from the kitchen. It's the main place people want to be. It's where the food is, it's where the drink is, it's where the best lighting is. You can go to any party and I guarantee you, the kitchen is going to be popping. Our ultimate goal I think would be to crash kitchens every Friday all around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Legend of the Traveling TARDIS. My name is Christian Basil, and as you just saw briefly, that was just a bit thumbnail of what's going on over at our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, The Legend of the Traveling TARDIS, the 25 Days of Humus. Uh, we are having bits, uh, clips from Doctor Who. We've got pictures from classic uh, Traveling TARDIS, as well as new stuff coming up over here, and uh, just some all-round Christmas holiday fun for everybody up until the 25th of December. So go check it out. Don't forget to subscribe. YouTube, uh, YouTube.com slash The Legend of the Traveling TARDIS and Facebook.com slash The Traveling TARDIS. Welcome back, everybody, as we interview the lovely Hannah and Ken. Uh, they're going to talk more about their book, about things. Um, so You're in, in your commercial break. What's I, that? I, 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 have, I said during oh, a commercial okay, break wait, 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 for, wait, wait, for Mackenzie's yeah. book, which is absolutely wonderful. Thank you. I, I have it right. Ben's plugging. <laughs> yeah, I'm plugging. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah, and I was just thinking, I'm like, I need to get an autographed book from both of you, and I'm sure somehow I got to get an autographed book of my book to you guys. <laughs> Well, yeah, and and uh, and and you have a standing invitation to come to Long Island, of course, yes. and and, and mm -hmm. um, you know, pitch your wares, so to speak. Yeah, <laughs> is that code anyway? Yes, and I'm happy to see him, but we got a new date too. That's a little bit that I saw. I'm like, oh, well, finally, not November. Yes. <laughs> yes. Did you want? Yes, to I know that's. I, I mean, we're here we are. Straying off topic, but that's part of the Doctor Who fan's life. Yeah, we're moving the show to August, uh, which is very exciting. And I and I actually received some really nice feedback when uh, we were in Chicago TARDIS a couple weekends ago. People oh, saying exactly what you said. Oh, great. It's not in November. And as a teacher, I can tell you that um, I'm, I'm very happy it's not in November anymore. And it's on my summer break. Uh, hey, Ken. Hopefully the audience hey, hey, Ken. Ken. Yeah. August twentieth. August twentieth is my birthday, so that would be a great oh. birthday present to come up to LA who and see the, you know. All right. Let's do some stuff out there. So sure. everybody, if you uh, for those of you who are listening onto the audio, Long Island Who has been established as uh, for next year. Uh, it's going to be taking place August eighteenth through the twentieth. Hey, if you got your, if you want to see me and you got birthday presents, hey, I uh, you know the <laughs> vendors out there are pretty cool. Uh, this is going to be taking place at the Holiday Inn Long Island in Holtzville. New York, if you want more information, again, for those of you listening to the audio, longislanddoctorwho.com. That's longislanddoctorwho.com. You can also follow L.I. Who on the Facebook page. You're also on Twitter. And Any other medias out there? Uh, Instagram, just about everything. Just, cool, just 
just about everything. Although there's a bunch of new things popping up now. And um, I, I'll add my cat to your. Oh uh, God! Yeah, like, she heard yeah, me talk. No, it's her. There, yeah, she I thought it was for her. Proud of and yourself. <laughs> he must be talking to me because there's no one else in the house. There you go. Well, let's go ahead and get things started. Uh, tell us a little bit about the book. So, ladies first. So, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> tell us a little bit about the book for those who are not familiar with the book and why they should get this book. Well, it's yeah. um, it's one of the one of the first. Ken, correct me if I'm wrong. Books about just the villains of Doctor Who, um, and it's this really interesting look at villains through the ages so from classic who and from new who and a lot of comparative essays which are the ones that i'm really excited about and looking at um there are some authors in there talking about the way that villains have changed over the history of the show talking about um the villains from there's one about body positivity and fat phobia talking about uh villains like the slithine mm -hmm. and putting a putting a sort of a, a modern day lens on things that I mean, the world was such a different place even five, 10 years ago, right? Yeah. So looking at that, looking back, even not to classic Who, looking back to older new Who and thinking about it from this brand new perspective is something that I find really interesting. Um, although I really think, I think, I think you probably want to hear about Ken's essay when, you, when we're talking about different perspectives <laughs> and brand new takes on what makes a villain in the universe here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it over to him. I really want to hear oh, him. Okay. <laughs> you heard brought up thing. One of the things about this book, um, we, the the challenge from uh, Dave Bushman and Barnaby Edwards, when they were putting um, a group of authors together to write something, was to try to find something new to say about villains. It's very easily easy to say, oh, the Daleks are the the biggest villains in the universe and they're Doctor Who's number one baddie and then the Cybermen are number two. That doesn't tell you anything about their motivations or for that matter, what kind of depth they bring to the show. There's a reason Doctor Who has been around for coming up on 60 years and that's because in all great literature, your hero is only as amazing as the strength of their adversary, of their villains. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you think of James Michael Bond... Green. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that's really great. Um, Chris Chibnall, um, <laughs> oh, well, he said it, not me. I'm saying, <laughs> uh, you know, J James Bond yes, always has these larger than life villains. Uh, Superman, right? Lex Luthor. If Lex Luthor is a weak villain, Superman doesn't actually look extraordinary, and the doctor's the same. So, the doctor has to, uh, I think, you, you, you. You gauge your doctor up against villains, let's say, like the Master, like the Daleks. Uh, I, I found it interesting with Jodie Whittaker's doctor that I really didn't see her at her full force as the doctor until she battled the Daleks. And that was because that's a known quantity. She, it was wonderful that Chibnall decided that they were going to create new adversaries for her first season. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the right decision. But when you get to battle the Daleks, that's a quantity that we've seen William Hartnell, Patrick Troutland, John Perry, et cetera, et cetera, all battle through the course of history. So her take on that battle is how we determine her standing as a doctor or, or maybe not standing, but you know what I mean? You, you get a sense of the doctorness of the portrayal when you yeah. battle that, that known quantity. I've, I've veered, of course, through this whole thing, but... Um, but so this so this whole book was about finding fresh ways of talking about something that we're all familiar with. It wasn't just a a, a history book or some kind of chronological um, uh, making of book. We wanted to have something fresh to say. And you think about the villains in Doctor Who, uh, the the one that I originally. I know it's going to sound like a broken record to Hannah, but I really wanted to have the, I wanted the Silurians and Sea Devils to be my essay. Um, and uh, Jan Fennick got there first and she did a wonderful essay on it. And I'm, I'm certainly not knocking it because she's brilliant. Um, it, it forced me to go into something else, but, but those, those villains, the, the whole concept of having, 
creatures that rightfully inhabited our planet before we got here. I mean, my God, that's so brilliant and challenging. It's everything that's great about science fiction and, and, and why the five of us and, and all the people watching find science fiction interesting. It's that it's, it's telling those tales. It's telling those what ifs. And what I want to do right now is for people who are, you know, on another device who may want to peruse what we're talking about a little bit of an odd link, but there it is right there. Uh, so you can check it out for yourself. I'm not going to read it to the radio. Oh, oh my <clears throat> gosh. What is that? It's, yeah, it's, it's like a, it's the alphabet link. just vomited. It is. <laughs> the alphabet did just vomit on there. I said, Ken was a cool dude. Yeah. Uh, that is Tom Kosak. He was former. Thank you, Tom. Uh, yeah, the check's in the mail. Yep. He was former um, president of the Guardians of Gallifrey here in Orlando. So, Oh, fantastic. My oh, Morden. Hey, Morden. How you doing? Uh, my favorite people live. Hey, thank you for I was just having a conversation about him and World of, Worlds Apart uh, while I was in Philly. So how are the chapters breaking down? You said there are tw about 11 to 12 writers on this. How How, how is everything divvied up in the book between the... Uh, for a better term, as we make the authors between you guys, they're mostly broken up by villain. Okay. Um, so there's there are different chapters for although you can't necessarily tell from the cover. Um, there is each villain only appears once, um, and then on the cover, the reason I say this is because and the cover is so beautiful. I think, but um, the master is the one who appears multiple times, of course, because there are multiple versions of the master. Um, but I think one of the interesting things going through and reading everybody else's work for me was noticing how um, everyone, everyone comes in with a different perspective on the doctor, right? Of course. I mean, that's part of what all of us love about Dr. Who is that is this, he, they are this incredibly multifaceted character in ways that most main characters don't get to be. Most main characters don't get to evolve over the course of decades and over the course of so many different actors. Um, and really, I think one of the brilliant things about any story that uses time travel is time travel is the license to rewrite the plot instantly. Mm. Right? Time travel gives the, gives the writers the ability to go back and change history and rewrite things and come up with alternate realities and different versions and paradoxes without having it break any of the rules by definition. And the doctor gets reinvented in so many different ways and the villains get reinvented in so many different ways. And sometimes that means new takes like the Silurians, right? Like new takes on villains that we've been seeing for this epically long time. And what does it mean to look at the same story from a new perspective? Right. And sometimes that means the doctor running into somebody and he's got this long history with them. Like in my piece, I was talking about River Song and running into somebody where there's a question of who remembers what and who's really in charge of the story and who has power over who has power over the narrative, right? In ways that I don't I, I get I tend to get really heady and philosophical about this stuff. I, I sort of look at it in terms of villains and heroes. Sometimes I'll ask myself like who's it's not who's winning who's winning the fight, it's who's winning the story, who's winning our empathy. You know, which is I don't know, I don't know that everybody looks at it that way, but that's I, I tend to get lost in that sometimes. I, I have a question for you, and I'm, I'm trying to phrase this as best I can to make sense out of it. Yeah. Who, which villain or monster do you think challenges the very moral core of the Doctor best? Mm. See, I, I, I'll go back to the Silurians and the Sea Devils because that's, that's that's what I feel. I feel I love those two adversaries. And I call them adversaries because they're not enemies. They've actually kind of got the moral high ground when they say, you know, you people are, uh, are invaders. Who are the true too. invaders, yeah. Who are the true invaders? Right. The and, and, that, and that's, a, that's an incredible moral dilemma for the doctor because who does he pick? You know, he, he loves humans. I mean, that's why he keeps camping out here um, and, uh, and, and, and takes the... Uh, takes the humanoid image, the humanoid form. Um, so that's, that would be my take on it. I mean, but, but that could go, the, the joy of this is that, that, that the debate doesn't necessarily end there, right? You could, 
Hannah could have a different opinion, or we could talk about every incarnation of the master and 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 each beef that every single one of them had with the doctor. Um, Hannah, same question. What? Who challenges the doctor's core? I do have an answer to that question, but I want to hear yours since you wrote the book. <laughs> oh, uh, that's a. I mean, I, I sort of, I sort of talk about that in my piece. Actually, I talk about oh, okay. that with Errata. Um, not in a comparative way. I don't. I don't actually know that I can pick. I don't know that I can pick who challenges them the most. Um, definitely, the Silurians and the Sea Devils are up there. I agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. I think, and anybody. I mean, this is this is what I say a lot in my chapter about the Vashnarada is this idea that Ken was just that. talking about of being there first. Right. Of who is who is the victim here? Right. Who is actually at fault? Who is the person or the creature or the empathetic character who is least deserving of blame? But mm -hmm. part of the point here is that everybody is deserving of blame. It's this incredibly complex world with millennia of history, like far beyond anything that humans can comp can comprehend or empathize with. Um, I think it. I think it's a long list. I also think he challenges himself in a lot of ways. I think he's he's got, especially in New Who, he's got this incredible. Like we see it a lot with Tennant, but it comes up for each of them in different ways. He's got this angst and this self hatred of, and I think there. I mean, we could talk about why that's true and where that comes from for days. Um, Actually, I think if if you don't mind me interjecting, I think yeah. the best scene about this is the scene where the three of them are in the fiftieth anniversary in the jail cell. And they're looking at each other and they're literally talking to themselves, but in from three different perspectives, a man who forgets and the man who regrets mm -hmm. and the war doctors yeah. looking on this, like, this is what I become. And just having, you know, those second thoughts about that. I'm going to bring up this um, question from Melanie, just in case, uh, is it better to buy the book directly from you, your publisher or Amazon? And the question. answer is yes. <laughs> as long as they the book. Gotcha, um, it, it's all good. Whatever, whatever is most convenient for you. I was going to say, say, Chris, we should bring that up right before, uh, right before we go to commercial, and then you did. I was in Sorry, the yeah, okay, no. private chat. <laughs> no, that's fine. I mean, we could. I mean, we can always address that later out there. Um, Andrew Morris, uh, when I posed the question, he says the Valyard. Mm, yeah, Challenges absolutely. The mortal core of the Doctor. I would even. My two choices were this, and I know I had to honestly separate them uh the scene in genesis of the daleks between davros the the famous scene between the fourth doctor and davros mm -hmm. whereas usually you see a leader like tying you know like james bond being tied down and say no mr bond i expect you to die but davros for a better term geeks out with them he goes doctor i just want to talk to you scientists i signed you know and he's he's just mm -hmm. geeking out they're not having a fight they're having a conversation, but they're interacting with each other through their mental. And Davros a... is Davros is def is desperate for that uh, for that approval. Yes, he's al he almost wants you know, you know that that the the the, the, the you know he wants something from the doctor to say. Listen, you know, I I, I found my equal. And I need you mm -hmm. because there's nobody else here that's the same. I've got uh, you know aliens and metal cans and everybody else is an idiot but i finally found somebody who's my equal here and i want to show you my thought process and then the doctor goes oh god whatever <laughs> <laughs> uh Dabra sees the doctor as an intellect equal intellect and wants to yeah. trust him yep andrew yep uh -huh. perfect because so, he's uh, Davros is surrounded by by sycophants who tell him what he wants to hear so you have to have an outsider come he mm -hmm. he's desperate for that outsider to tell him the, what he perceives as the truth, which is a, agreement with his exact plan. And, and the only person who can give him an honest answer is an outsider. Because, He's again, outsider, yeah. if you're surrounded by people who are yes-men, you're not going to get a, a, an honest answer. You're going to get the answer they think you want to hear. Exactly. And then it's not only that, but, yeah, he's got yes-men around him. Now there's this one person that came out of nowhere they're both yep. intellectually smart and challenging each other. Mackenzie, do you have a question for the team? I do, actually. And I also want to bring out that whole 
going off of the conversation we were having, I think that's also one of the reasons why the doctor likes to travel with a companion because it will keep him or her leveled. Mm -hmm. And uh, GD agrees. That's my other cat. She just went, <laughs> so she agreed with that comment. <laughs> so my question yeah. is, how did this book come about? Are you having 16 different authors? I've been part of anthologies as well. So I'm curious, <laughs> how did it all start? Hello, Joe. Lord Joe. So how did it all begin? Uh, it was a it was a call out I think um, from the publisher Fayetteville Mafia Press, which is Dave Bushman, and uh -huh. um, and Barnaby Edwards, who was his his co editor on this particular book, and and Hannah actually was involved pretty early on. Do you remember how you were approached about this? Yeah, I um, you know, it just it was a Facebook post. Somebody shared like, hey, this is an opportunity to submit. I think a friend sent it to me because it's because it's, somebody saw it was like, oh, look, it's the Venn diagram of you're a writer and you're the only person I know who likes Doctor Who. I saw this. You should do it. You know, and it's it's interesting. I'm actually really new to um, I am not new to being a fan of Doctor Who, but I'm new to fandom. Um, this is sort of my first foray into Doctor Who community. So I would I would never have stumbled across it on my own. You know, there wasn't. David wasn't going to reach out to me and say, "Hey, I know you from this con." Like it, it was just sort of random and fortunate. And, and mine random. is a little bit different. I, I've known random. Dave Bushman since he was at the Paley Center in New York, and I first met him when the Eleventh Hour premiered. And um, he and I have stayed in contact over the years. And then he left Paley and, and formed a publishing company. So I, I followed it, you know, on on social media, always wanting to see people i know succeed and then out of nowhere was a, a, a post about calling all doctor who people i'm like that's me <laughs> and uh i too this is my first published piece in any kind of um doctor who related thing and and i'm a 40 year you know 40 years active in in doctor who fandom and for me to finally you know break this wall down was, was kind of a thrill and and probably uh the, the biggest thrill is just having my mom, who is a voracious reader, get a book in the mail that had my name in it. So um, that, that made it all worthwhile. Mom, that college tuition paid off. <laughs> Andrew, Your son's not a complete idiot. Andrew's got a question. Um, we'll, we'll address the question after the commercial break when we return with our guest, and <laughs> Anna Freeman <laughs> and Ken Deep. Uh, when we return, please continue to stay logged on, tuned in, and we got a special guest coming in right around the corner. You have more options than ever before when choosing a film, a television, or internet series, a book to curl up with, or even a radio show or podcast. Get to know the people who are creating for you. The Hangin' With Web Show, hosted by award-winning author and journalist G.W. Pometry, is the Internet's fastest-growing web talk show series. The Hangin' With Web Show features professional, yet casual, in-depth interviews with creative arts and entertainment pros. Meet the people behind a digital revolution in creating more quality content than ever before in the history of media. Find the Hanging With Web Show on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, or simply go to www.hangingwithshow.com. That's www.h-a-n-g-i-n-with-show.com.
What's up, What's internet? What's up, internet? Paparazzo, Paparazzo Dave, Dave Chapman, Chapman, Chapman here. here. And as I'm and recording, as I'm recording this, this, it's almost the holiday, the holiday season. season. What that means what that is that means almost is time all... for me to start decking these halls for our annual holiday review series. This year is part of our holiday series. We're going to be talking to Jared A. Sorensen, creator of Parsley. If you've ever played Zork, Oregon Trail, any of those old text parser games, that's what this is, but in analog form. And after we talk, some other friends are going to join us on the feed, and we're going to actually play through Kringle Crisis. This is a Parsley game, and we're going to take your command suggestions right from the comments section. So join us December 7th at 4 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Eastern for this live event. Don't forget to head over to our link tree. That's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash the rathole dot C-A, where you'll find that video that's coming up as well as our Christmas giveaway and all the places you can enter that. Hopefully we'll see you soon. Back to the show. I want to personally thank Patty Hawkins, the team at GalaxyCon. I'm going to put in a little short. Tell me if you see a particular TARDIS. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Legend of the Traveling Tardis. My name is Christian Basil, and we got to give a shout out to Catherine Tate. She celebrated her 53rd birthday just recently. Uh, her 53rd birthday. I'm trying to find where the date is. Oh, okay. December 5th, just yesterday. So, yesterday, happy birthday to Catherine Tate. She turns a lovely, I don't, I don't think she's bothered, but she is a lovely 53 years old. And for people who've been asking, I'm sorry, that's an old picture of Catherine. No, she doesn't have a broken hand. She's fine. Uh, that was just, uh, she, I think she had a skiing accident and she was lovely enough to take a picture of the TARDIS. So, thank you, Catherine. Happy birthday out there. Welcome back to The Legend of the Traveling TARDIS. My name is Christian Basil. We are here with a lovely Ken Deep and as well as the lovely Hannah Friedman talking about their book, as you can see in the title. Let's bring it up over here. Uh, at the World of Demons, the Villains of Doctor Who. And we had a question from the audience. Let me bring, see if I can find it. Doom, 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 doom. Well, you look. Is there an audiobook version of this? Or is oh, there yeah. one planned? Oh, you're, you're, you oh, are. Oh, my. Uh, hang oh. on. Sorry, for whatever reason, your mics came undone as soon as I was running commercials. I had to, I had to close you up for some odd reason, but go for I, it. He, I think right. you had to, on, you had to mute me because I was laughing about the, the bathroom <laughs> book, which I've, I've actually just looked up while we were in break. Um, you mean that? Hi. Oh my God, there it is. Hi. <laughs> For everybody who, yes, Jamie's hysterical. for real. <laughs> that is for real. <laughs> and um, yes, she did have no, an endorsement from the people at Squatty Potty. So yeah, they, go ahead, Ken. I'm sorry. Oh, it's it's not available on audiobook yet. Um, I already had Matthew Jacobs read um, the first few pages of my uh, uh, of my chapter at Chicago Tardis, and I recorded it, and I was like. Damn, we got to make this into an audio book. So, I've got to, um, I've got to convince Dave Bushman over at Fayette, Fayetteville Mafia Press to, uh, you know, would be great, and, and I'm sure we all agree on this. How how amazing would like Paul McGann's voice reading anything? Maybe the oh, ingredients to Cheerios or something. Anything the man reads is just velvet, you know. Oh yes. Well, I mean, if you can get yes. the, uh, if he's available, Tom Baker. <laughs> you can read the phone book. Yes. I know we would all live in there. Uh, Andrew Morris says another question. Which of the Doctor's enemies actually do think they are villainous and are not justified in what they are doing? Hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll go with the obvious one, the Daleks. They think they're always right. They're very insecure. And, um, you know, they just don't see the value in anything else other than themselves. And that is, that's probably as as heinous as you can possibly get. Yeah. Hannah? I don't, I don't think they do. I don't think they act in any way for anyone else's benefit. Where, like, the Cybermen, the Cybermen, like, hey, we can make everything better. Like, check us out. If we, if you put all these robotic parts, you'll never die. And they kind of think they're doing the right thing, even if they're not. You know, they're, mm. they're, they're, they're maybe the end, the, the end doesn't justify the means, but they, they kind of think they're in the right. 
the Daleks are just they're just terrible. They just want to destroy everything. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I would I would give the same answer. I think, and this reminds me of a conversation you and I keep having, Ken, about what makes a good villain. You know, and mm. I think, and you'll you'll be bored of hearing me say this, but I think what makes a good villain is um, an empathetic character, is somebody who, um, whatever their reasons, whether we agree with them or not, and I think in some in some stories this is even true for the Daleks, where um, even if we think they're terrible, they believe in what they're doing so deeply that there's some kernel of like, ah, if I were in your shoes. I would probably be doing the same thing. I think that makes for much better storytelling. Um, and just when you're, when you're really invested in both sides of it, even if you disagree with one of those sides, um, that makes it more of a, more of an emotional struggle for me anyway, as a viewer. Yeah. And the, I think the reason that people, classic fans worship Genesis of the Daleks and modern fans worship Dalek is because in both of those cases, there's something more than just them stomping around, right? You, 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 um, you're given, you're given some insight into w how these things all transpired to get where you want to go. And to your point, then suddenly you're like, Oh wow, this, you know, this Dalek's been chained up here. And, and now the, the doctor's torturing the Dalek and, you know, the Dalek's still kind of a jerk, but, the doctor is even more of a jerk, you know, um, and, and with the genesis of the Daleks, that formation, right? They, they were, they were fighting this war and, 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 and one group in that war went one direction and one group went another direction. And those are real things. They, they can, they can happen right here on earth. So we, uh, we as viewers relate to it. We see, well, this could have happened in world war one or world war two. And, and um, and that makes it real. It makes it something that you can lock in on. I would say which vi my next question is which villain or monsters do you think got a bad rap in classic Who that you would like to see them brought up in new? Mm, wow. Who would you like to see the evolution? I jokingly said the the Bannerman because they were so god awful. <laughs> In the episode, yeah, I said, I'm, I would I would think the Bannermen now today, if you were to bring them into current day, they would probably be very, very violent. <laughs> they would be very, very evil. Well, do you remember a few years back when there was a rumor, this was probably in RTD1, when mm -hmm. there was a rumor that, that one of the stories was going to be about Megalos, of all things, my my uh, succulent friend. Um, you know, and that's Megalos kind of gets a bad rap, but he's a cactus, like for crying out loud. You know, Doctor Who said, we've got this foam cactus that we bought at the at the furniture store. And, well, he can talk if we just give him a voiceover. And, you know, then he turns into the doctor and no one wants to cosplay him. I don't know why. Um, so, I mean, it's <laughs> stuff like that. I, there. <laughs> I came to Doctor Who... The thing I think from kind of being casually kept catching a few episodes to the thing where I, I absolutely blew my mind was Keeper of Trocken. And not particularly that I want to see that story done again, but I'm, I'm talking mostly about the creativity of it, was mm -hmm. I was watching this story on PBS and, and here's this statue that everyone thinks is just a statue, but all of a sudden it starts talking and all of a sudden people get hypnotized by it and then all hell breaks loose. And I was like, damn, they don't do this on American television. And so any anything would, like that, you can take almost would, any no. of those, th those amazing stories that we've had for the first 29 years and, and rev it up where you can say, okay, well, we now have CGI or we have the budget mm -hmm. or we can... You know, I don't know. We can get, uh, I don't know, some famous actor to voice the character or something. There's so much more that they have the resources to do now. Um, but it is a great question because that's part of the fun of what we do as fans, right? Is yeah, well, what would be great, you know? I, I don't want to bring up right, little rubber suits. I, I, I don't want to bring up an old wound because you mentioned the uh, the the name that shall not be mentioned <laughs> beforehand, our former uh, showrunner, but. 
one of the things I disagreed with him when he started his run was that um, when he started, he said he was going to disavow anything, you know, in the classic, no classic directors, no writers, no monsters or anything. And I thought that was a grave mistake. And I think that was one thing that RTD realized that he needed the classic Whovians to come into the new series to help it out. And I still think you have a treasure trove of classic Who stuff that still has to be unearthed into the new series that would be, you know, getting its awakening, whether it be CGI or new prosthetics or, or, you know, a different dimension or even the, you know, the Time Lords. What are they doing? Did the Rani fight in the Time War? Did the Monk fight in the Time War? Are they still alive? What's Omega doing? Is he still um, stuck right. in that uh, a black hole? Did he do anything in the Time War? I mean, uh, I, I, as I jokingly argue, there's more than three Time Lords on Gallifrey, Jibnall. You can use them at any given time. So, uh, but and that was a, my thing. Not to put too, too hard on, on Chris, but I actually, I yeah. thought it was, a, was a, a, an interesting idea to try to he wanted to establish his own thing early on. And there is some merit to that. What Russell did was a mix of the both. He didn't yeah. shove all the fan service in, but he also didn't go completely blank in, in Christopher Eccleston's season. He he let it drip in like a slow tap and 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 like a like a cat. Uh, you know, sitting there with the tongue out, we were just gobbling it up because we were like, yes, more of that, please, more of that. And he slowly turned the faucet on, and we were completely hooked. Well, I, as I mentioned in, in previous podcasts, I said, like, you can bring in the Daleks with the Vashon Narada. You can bring in the Cybermen and then the Ood. You can bring in the Centaurans and the Weeping Angels. Mix it up a bit there and make something of the new monsters that come out out there. Um, we got a commercial break. When we return, I got a question for you two. And we are in discussions uh, with uh, Hannah Friedman and Ken Deep. Uh, of course, you can see in the chat and also uh, um, in the, what they call it on the YouTube thing, in the description. Gosh, there's a link on the description as well. Uh, the world, uh, a, a world of demons, the villains of Doctor Who. When we return, please continue to stay logged on to it. Oop, let me go ahead and bring you up up there. That's what the book looks like. When we return, please continue to stay logged on, tune in, and become part of the legend. Last commercial break will be right. The doctor. I'm the doctor. But not the one you were expecting. All right, sexy. It's time to go home. Doctor Who Velocity. Streaming now. You seem to be drifting, sweetheart. I'm not drifting. I'm waiting. What for? The right man. I've seen him. I've met him just once. And then I let him fly. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Legend of the Traveling Tardis. My name is Christian Basil. We are here with Hannah Friedman and Ken Deep, who are contributors to the book A World of Demons, the villains of Doctor Who, as we continue our discussion. Don't forget that you can always... Ooh, sorry. Not <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, you continue uh, with our chats. If you have any questions about the book, it's, uh, it's in the description. If you want to purchase the book, how much is the book, Ken? It's $20. $20. Or is so it $19.99? That's one of those... Things that they do, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, nineteen ninety nine. It's definitely not twenty dollars. It's one cent less. Okay, 
then the shipping and handling comes in. There's your pennies. <laughs> so uh, definitely, if you want to check out the book yourself, and if you want to get a purchase, this is make a nice Christmas gift for your fellow Whovian in this time of year. A World of Demons, the villains of Doctor Who. Link is in the description, as well as in the chat. We're back here. Um, Dave, you said Melanie had a question, right? Yes, she did. Gotcha. And... Bring it on up. And then I got a question for our guests. Totally wrong set. There we go. There. Uh, there you go. You wrote about your villain. Did you set parameters around their appearance? Uh, TV only, books, big finish, etc. Oh. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, Hannah, you, you'll you start with this one. Well, I was I, I had it very easy. Um, I wrote about the Vox Narada, and they did appear in Big Finish, I think. Thanks. Yes, they did. They did. Um, fifth, but fifth, I would, I nobody like, understood it was the fifth doctor. So I think it was, yeah, they, they showed up, but I'm just like, okay, that's weird. <laughs> right. Like they sort of breezed through and I was really interested. Um, like I said, my, my nine to five work is I do, um, I write about mental health and I do a lot of research and I cite a lot of data and I'm, it's really interesting stuff. And I wanted to go in the exact opposite direction for this. So I think if you look in the back, if you look at the citations of all of the different pieces, I'm pretty sure I'm the only author who only cited two episodes. I'm not talking about the whole history of it. I'm not talking about other criticism. I'm not talking about Star Trek episodes and how it compares. It's just those two. Sure. So I, um, and the Vash Narada also, because they have so many finite appearances. I mean, it's not like I was writing about the Daleks, right? Um, so for me, for me, that was a pretty simple proposition. How about you, Ken? I um, so uh, my essay, which um, Hannah kind of teased a little bit earlier, my essay because I didn't get the Silurians and Sea Devils. Um, yeah. I, I, what I what I picked to try to come up with something to to say something different. I uh, I actually posed the question: What if the Doctor is the villain? of the piece and uh at the risk of getting pitchforks and torches from doctor who fans at conventions for the next decade i <laughs> i actually wrote the piece in, in kind of a tongue-in-cheek way so it's meant really just to have a little bit of fun with the concept and i didn't realize that it would get so many discussions going in and now i've guaranteed myself panel time for for the next decade uh <laughs> with the topic and um so, but I did keep it to just televised appearances, and and actually in the piece, I try to represent each of the doctors where possible, starting all the way back in 1963. But I deliberately left gaps where I, I it wasn't like a an encyclopedia of every time the doctor did something questionable. I I picked a few places, I made some statements about things, especially if I could be funny about them. But I deliberately wanted to leave room in the essay to breathe, to allow the reader to say, ah, he should have mentioned this, or I wish he would have said this, or something like that, so that we can have this discussion, um, whether it's now or a year from now or, or 10 years from now, someone can say, I've read your piece, and I was thinking, what about this? And and that's an icebreaker for me when I when I get a chance to meet people face-to-face -face or on a podcast or anything like that. Uh, to be able to have that conversation. It, it all really stemmed from, you know, we we are all fans of things, particularly talk to, but we, we get very serious about what we do. So what, what happens is we watch the same crap over and over and over again. Watch the, uh, the Warriors of the Deep for the 10,000th time. So after a while, you have to find a new way of looking at it. And I, and I like that. I like the sort of fan theory idea, like, Okay, I'm gonna go back and watch this, but what if what if I watched it from a different point of view? And and that's how the essay opens. If you know, we're, we're gonna have another cat appearance, but the the one I always start with is what if Jonesy in the original Alien movie was an android? Because everywhere Jonesy shows up, people die. And so now I watch the movie and I go, damn, that cat keeps showing up and people die. What if the cat's been setting up the whole thing? The alien is not even the bad guy. The alien is just trying to get off the ship, but that cat is murdering people. This sounds like fun. And it's just a fresh way for me to watch a movie I've seen 18 million times. And there's another cat appearance, right? <laughs> Although it's not Jonesy. <laughs> no, it's worse. It's uh, Beaker, one of my cats. <laughs> Andrew Moore says, Ronnie, I think has right issues. 
a few of the classic writers uh, kept the right to characters. RTD has the right balance of old and new. Yeah, and in, and in Russell, we trust. I've been saying that for almost 20 years now, back when, when I was on Doctor Who Podshock. I was famous for saying in Russell, we trust because it was Russell's time way back then. And I can, I continue to say it. I am a, I'm a big, big fan of Russell and I have complete confidence going forward that, that the show is in the right hands. Mm -hmm. I have a question for the both of you. When doing your research on your respective villains, monsters, was there something about the villain monster that you either weren't aware about or appreciated more during your research, you're like, oh my God, I didn't realize this, or oh my God, this was, you know, this is something that I really like about this particular monster that I that I researched. Mm, good question. That's for Hannah. The moment, the moment for me that really mm. came to mind um, is so in in Silence in the Library in the first episode of that two parter, there's a moment in the very beginning, the first time we sort of get a hint that the shadows are or I guess not the first time, maybe the second time we get a hint that the shadows are dangerous and we want to keep an eye on what's going on there. Um, so we've got Cal's security camera, that little sphere that's bobbling around and we don't yet know how it's connected to this girl we keep seeing in yeah. her family's living room, right? But we know there's a connection and we have all these big questions and then we see a shadow has latched onto her security camera and it's interesting and it took me and this is i don't know how many times i've seen this two-parter this is my 47th time watching it through right and i'm and i was watching it because a lot a lot of my process as a writer is just getting to know something so well that i can't help but find those new perspectives like ken was talking about so this was like the third time that week i had watched this episode intentionally trying to desensitize myself to all of the like big exciting parts of it so I could really look down into the details. And the detail that I noticed is so here we've got this big sunny room mm -hmm. and we've got Donna and we've got the doctor and these are the first two flesh and blood mammals that have been in the library in a hundred years. Right. The other crew hasn't arrived yet, right? It's just the two of them. And the Vashtanarada latch onto a security camera. Why are they doing that? Are they attracted to movement? If they were attracted to movement, then it the dust that's like they're not they're not the only dust in sunbeams, right? Like a skin cell that came off of somebody a hundred years ago could still be floating around there. They could latch onto that, they could latch onto a fly, they could latch onto any bacteria, right? Anything. It's not just movement. There's a reason they're following Cal around. And there's no evidence there. There's nothing to talk about. They don't ever they don't ever mention why that happened or explain it throughout the rest of the episodes. It's sort of a throwaway, like, hey, look, the shadows are moving. Look, there was a shadow there and now it's gone. What's casting it? Right. Mm -hmm. But that was really eye-opening for me to think about because my whole piece is about empathy and who's like how compassion makes us villainous, how the act of being compassionate is related to our ability to hurt people. Um, and so there, the fact that they understand this is a living creature, the fact that they're like, I'm going to latch onto the security camera. It's not a bookshelf. They picked her for a reason. And that's the thing that lets us understand that they're carnivorous almost like that's the big, and that was, I hadn't noticed that detail until I was in the middle of writing this. And there's, I wish I, I wish there were more to say about it in my actual essay. It's sort of, it's a sort of throw away paragraph as a detail of like, hey, here's a cool thing to think about. Um, and again, this is me like getting super heady and lost in the philosophical details as I do. But so. Cool. Well, like, folks, um, we are coming to the audio end of the portion. Our crypt friends on, on sci-fi.radio, I apologize. We're coming to the end of the show, but please, um, we got 30 minute after party and Hannah and Ken, you're more than welcome to stay to just geek out a little bit more. But as we end the audio portion of our show, don't forget to join us. iHeartRadio, sci-fi.radio. You can download the app for free, Odyssey, Spotify, Spreaker, Podbean, wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. You can listen to us, download the episodes for free. Don't forget, again, Facebook.com, the Legend of the Traveling, the Traveling Tardis, I should say, 64,000 Hoobians have grown. We are right on the doorstep, 65,000. Help us get there. Also, just for goof, we're on TikTok. <laughs> and right now, don't forget to subscribe. YouTube.com, The Legend of the Traveling Tardis. And as we remind people, we know that this is a stressful time of year. 
if you need to get help, if you need a friend out there, uh, 1-800-273-TALK or 1-800-273-8255. Reach out to somebody, a friend, anyone, please. But if you feel the need, get some help. You even call this number. It is 24-7. Or you can text them at 988 for the hotline to let people know, hey, this is a stressful and this uh, you, uh, this time of year can be full of anxiety, but don't let it get to you because you need to be around to become part of the legend. We're going into the after party, folks. We're going to continue our discussion with Hannah and Ken, and we're going to continue to geek out and answer your questions. But for those of you listening to the audio, thank you so much. Please stay safe and become part of the legend. Aha, okay, let's move on. <laughs> and for those of you watching on the Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and uh, Twitter, for some odd reason, our videos are going to Twitter now. Uh, yep. Thanks for sticking around. Um, so I have a question for the both of you. Did, was there anything in the chat? I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Uh, uh, there's no, a couple, no. but I also have a question as well. Oh, go for it, go for it. Yes, yeah. okay, by all means. Yeah, okay. so... I'm just hogging up the air here. <laughs> well, that's, okay. that's okay, that's that. the way usually it Shut works. Shut it, shut it, Dave, shut it. <laughs> so one of the questions I actually got a couple, but the one of the questions is if an opportunity like this would come up again, would you do it? And then to tie in my other question is did you find anything when you were writing your particular essay to be challenging other than what has already been said on the, the podcast? Ken? Answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I'm my, my the question. <laughs> um, I I did find it very challenging, but because I because I'm not um, a writer by nature, you know, I, I it's not like something I I I knew I wanted to do it. I knew I had the ability to do it, but I um, but it's not something like it's not it's not like I have this you know the great American book inside me. I I just really wanted to do it for enjoyment and, and for a little bit of, of personal pride. Um, so I, so it was challenging because I had to, I had to learn a, a whole new skill set, And luckily the editors were very supportive of that and allowed me to be a first timer. And I, I'm sure it's far from perfect, but, I, but I think it's, uh, I think it's actually kind of addicting. And, and uh, as Mackenzie can probably relate to because oh. Mackenzie is a, a, you know, you know, a multiple, uh, yeah, has multiple books to your credit. I, I think that um, I think it's addicting, and I think I want to do it again. Is is my answer? And I think the success of this book, even early on, um, has convinced Fayetteville Mafia Press to continue to put Doctor Who content out. And I know that both myself uh, and Hannah are are uh, excited about you know continuing our relationship with them. Yes. Awesome. I know for myself, I didn't even hear about this project that you were in. And if I had seen it on Facebook or anything, I definitely would have jumped on it. So if there is something where they're going to allow something well, like that I, in the future, yeah, keep me informed. So, <laughs> so it's funny. I mean, now that we're not, you know, we're not like sort of officially on air, but I have a. Um, we are. We're still I, I, <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not re recording. I mean, we're, we're live. Yeah. Uh, but I have a I have a thing in my my notes. And I don't know if you can see it, but I actually have Mackenzie's name on a list of people for the second book that I would recommend to the publisher. Oh, thank you! Just because I, I, you know, I followed you for a long time, and and um, and and we just well, always, not literally. I, <laughs> yeah, I'm not following you like through the window or anything like that. Uh, there she is. Oh. Cats. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but, but the object for us from the start was to find fresh perspectives. And I think that you're the type of person that if, if given a challenge like that would, would actually find that exciting. And, oh, and, yeah, and yeah. Want to... I love being challenged for things. That's one of the reasons why I do a lot of anthologies. A lot of people ask me that they're like, why do you do anthologies versus doing like going straight and just doing all novels and i'm just like well because there you can do so much with those challenges and find something that is like right now i have a story that i'm working on that has to do with a fairy tale and i'm i found a huge plot it last night i'm like oh i'm gonna have to rework this now <laughs> so, yeah. but i think that there um i think that the success of the book and 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 i when i say success of the book this is still an independent publisher but one of the reasons that i 
um, what what sold me on Fayetteville Mafia Press was that um, their distributor is just top notch. I mean, we're you know we're we're carried by all of the um, major booksellers in the United States and in the United Kingdom, and and really the point of doing something is to get heard. So um, while it's you know we're we're not uh, a name brand like a a King or a Patterson or something like that, which automatically people just stock your book. But we're making enough of a dent that this independent publisher is like, wow, Doctor Who is something people are interested in because they're yeah. buying the book. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, they, they, have a, they have a huge um, selection of cult publications. They started out and, and still to this day put out a lot of content for um, like Twin Peaks fandom. That, that's mm. actually where they got their start. Uh, but but I've branched in a number of different directions, and so now I'm 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 excited that they're going to continue with Doctor Who because I think it's like like we were saying about this first one, just good to have people um, putting out challenging ideas and and trying to find something new to say because the show's sixty years old. We it it it's tough not to retread. I mean, if you had a dollar, and the, on the fiftieth anniversary a decade ago, if you had a dollar for every person who put out uh you know just your your episode guidebook you'd, you'd be a millionaire and and while i'm sure every single one of them has something good to say um it would have been great to have someone say instead of me doing that i'm going to present a different perspective and what mm -hmm. i loved what you did was uh mckenzie was you were concentrating on the first female doctor, why this is important, what is groundbreaking about this, you know, what what's going to what's going to be exciting about this new era. And now with Shooty coming in, we're gonna be we're gonna be inundated uh, with I exciting. Can't wait to write that book because I'm working. I'm still working on the second book for. I, I'm I'm going from a with binge watcher guide. Is I'm looking. I'm doing a different perspective as well as in this particular one, I wanted to look at more of the doctor from a mental health perspective. So it was very interesting that we have Hannah on here. And that's one of the things for me, I'm not very much into the mental health. However, I have my own uh, challenges with mental health. So for myself, I found, well, if I look at it for myself and use that whole theme, because that is so fun and challenging. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we see a mental health crisis going on right over there with, with Christian. <laughs> Look at it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I I love that as a as a take on it or as an angle on writing about Doctor Who. That was one of my original pitches. So I originally pitched two different essays. I pitched the one I wound up writing about the Vash Narada. And I also pitched a piece about um Missy's last episode. Mm. Um and I was gonna the angle I was gonna use for that one had I gone in that direction was um analyzing the master through the lens of, of PTSD yes. and this redemption arc of this person who has PTSD because of their own villainy. Yes. Um, oh my God. I, I still want to write that essay. I still, I still want to do it someday. I just, I just got, I got too excited about the Vashon Rod and I couldn't for this one. Oh my I mean, the second we, book. <laughs> we, we were, we were pretty narrow in our focus with this and yet just the master as an example or go, drilling in even deeper just missy you could write so much stuff about whether it's ptsd uh the, the 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 near redemption that happens i mean it's like how close we got to redemption in that story it, it what what i love about her performance about um michelle's performance as missy in comparison to everyone probably since delgado created the character was that um, it wasn't a manic performance. It was a thinking performance. And that's what I loved when the character was originally created. The character was a thinking performance and not just a, a flailing kind of performance. Yes, absolutely. Because, because the character's more interesting if they're a schemer. You know, the, the schemes and you're like, and it's and it, uh, and it's almost like oh, I came so close to, you, you know, and the and the and in Delgado's era, it didn't matter if the plan didn't succeed as long as it annoyed the doctor, mm -hmm. he was happy. Mm -hmm. well, there's, a, 
for me, that goes back to the earlier question of what villains realize they're villains. And that's definitely most iterations of the master. He, there's no pretense of I'm trying to do good. It's I'm trying to mess up the doctor. I'm trying to do what I want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's another challenge from for in the second book is having to talk about the how the monster suddenly went just flipped like that and how that happened. And I have a theory of what happened. And so that's one of the things that I, even with the conclusion of the Jody's run, I still had, I, I had a theory at the beginning of the series and that theory still held <laughs> all the way through. What, what I'm curious about, and I, I think it was in a discussion that Hannah and I may have had on a panel, but do you remember we were talking about it was something with the ah hell I lost my train of thought <laughs> no. no because we were to what we were you know we just kind of to this point but there, there was just so much discussion and it was everything about what we've done with this has been so rich because we're talking to people and and the the greatest feeling is when panels are over that we're on. And people just coming up to wanting to continue the conversation because mm -hmm. it's 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 kicked off a dialogue. Yeah, it's yeah, such a great feeling. A absolutely, and one of the things for me that I found was like when I wrote Binge Watchers Guide is I had some people who came up to me. They said they had never watched Jody. They weren't even they hadn't even watched Doctor Who. And then I started talking about some of the things, and they're like, "I'm buying that book. I'm going to start watching the show." And I'm like. Just talking about just stuff like that on like a human level, and that's one of the things that I wanted to do with the second book is go into it. Actually, Andrew kind of went where my idea was, is saying that the Ninth Doctor could be argued to having PSTD, and that was I believe the Doctor has PTSD, and I also mm -hmm. can believe that possibly. Well, I think I definitely think that he she is also neurodivergent, which I am, and and there's certain ways that you express things that. Things just don't come across. Like there's a scene with Jody that with Graham that I absolutely loathe the scene so much because it came across as being comic or comedic, and I was just like, I didn't even think it was that. It was yeah. It was and just... I realized well, no, it was... when I sat back, I'm like, the doctors. If I look at this from a neo-divergent perspective, I'm like, I get where she's coming from, even knowing I disagree with how the scene played out. Well, we're talking about the. Uh the cancer reveal scene at the end of Praxis mm -hmm. um, when the, and this is where I just wanted to take Chibnall with a Nerf bat outside for a little <laughs> bit down there only because the doctor has seen worlds destroyed universes gone genocide at, you know, amongst the millions has lost people left and right. But this is the same doctor who stood in front of the pen on top of the pen uh, of, of, uh, uh, headstone. Yeah, Stonehenge. Stonehenge, sorry, Stonehenge. And the way I describe that scene is the doctor's reputation is the weapon. And the doctor's knowledge and know-how is the weapon. He's standing in front of all of his enemies. He's got his cards laid out, the 247 everything, and he's convinced the entire team, it, uh, the entire people, they're playing a game of poker, he's got his cards on the table, and he's convinced everybody he's got a royal flush. And there, and he says the one thing that makes it all worthwhile: let somebody else try first. And it's the brilliant, and everybody starts running off. It's like we don't know what to do. But anybody could have just taken a shot, and boom, that would have been the end of the doctor. But they were so scared because of his reputation, and who he was. Flash back to the moment where he's standing into the ark, and he's talking about Homo sapiens. That speech, that wild speech of um, Peter Capaldi when he's talking to. Um, the Zygon, the Zygon story, the war story. Now we're here and I'm socially awkward. No, this would have been the moment that you could have write some brilliant stuff for Jody to spout out, directed it so well. This is the moment where Jody's doctor could have flown and you could have, could have talked her. about the small battle, even though yes. even though she's taken on galaxies. Right. Even a small battle is something to I've do with that. I've never met somebody the who wasn't the battle important. doesn't matter. 
Yeah. Absolutely. It was a huge missed opportunity. This thing, Melanie, I don't even think it was a shot at comedy. It was just poor taste in general. It was just, they didn't, you, you could tell the writing didn't know classic who. And, and not even that. I don't even think they knew the who before that. The, the who that got developed by Russell T. and, and Moffat. The, that who that was coming into play. I just couldn't accept it. It, it was just bad characterization. But the reason why I bring this up is because I lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, that's okay, Christian, because I actually funny. remembered the conversation with Hannah was about that not every that that it doesn't always have the universe doesn't always have to be threatened. Was that our conversation yeah. at some point? Yeah. That sometimes yeah. you can you can just have one person be threatened, and this goes back to. The, the cancer um, uh, analogy that we were just right. talking about. One person battling cancer to that person is the battle of the universe. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can use that. You can use the doctor's knowledge of the universe to say this battle is just as important as battling for the entire universe. And he's even said that before. And um, I was just, I was just rewatching a Christmas Carol because it's Christmas, right? And um, and he says, and there's that beautiful moment where um, the I don't remember the Scrooge character's name, but the Scrooge character says, um, "Don't worry about her; she's not important." And he says, "Oh my God, how incredible!" In how however many hundreds of years, mm -hmm. and all of all of these sides mm -hmm. of the universe that I've seen, I have never once met someone who was not important. Right, and that's like to me that is that's so like that's why that's that's why I rewatched that episode because that mm -hmm. idea is so central to who Doctor Who is as a character, and you're I mean I agree with you that it's the like, Doctor with the breast writing the Doctor always knows what to say at that moment has the wit he's always yeah. and she's always three steps ahead verbally of what's yeah. going on in the room. Yeah. Chop Suey, the Galactic Emperor. Come on. <laughs> just some really fun stuff out there. And it just, one of the things that I, I was taking back to, like the episode Rosa, Crasco was just an abysmal villain. And and uh, I had to be convinced that this was the same villain that was locked up with River Song. No, a chance in hell. He was already taken out like two thirds of the episode. And somebody said, asked me, it's like, well, how would you make that episode better, Christian? I said, I have a great idea. Let's back to the future to it. So what happens is the TARDIS lands, somehow or another, there's smoke coming out of it. And the 13th Doctor tells everybody, listen, um, uh, we had to crash land here. By the way, be careful about the people around you. They're not all friendly. And guess what Brian does? He walks around, hops on a bus and accidentally sits in the seat where Rosa was supposed to sit. Right. inadvertently stopping civil rights. And I think the story would have been a very different take that Ryan did by accident. And now I think the stakes are even higher. And if you can write that and direct that really well, I just like, there was no reason for a Crasco. I just didn't see it in there. It was just, a, here's this evil guy. He's just evil for no apparent reason. And it just killed it for me. Yeah. I, but that's I my opinion. With that episode. But at least Russell's coming back. Yes. 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 But I'm, 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 I'm always sound mind when things like this, because for a while he was saying he was never going to come back. He was like, he doesn't go back. Yeah, to that's what Capaldi old. says. He's never coming back till he comes back. Till he comes back. Yeah. yeah. But I'm just like, it, it's one of those things, you know, the old Reagan thing, trust but verify. Mm hmm. So I'm walking on eggshells. Yes, uh, we are happy that the show is in good hands. Bought by Bad Wolf, which was bought by Sony, now on Disney Plus. Go figure. Wow, yeah. things I would never see that Doctor Who would ever become are now even happening. What was that line there? Well, look, oh, like Mark Hamill said, he was not happy with Luke in Episode Eight, but this wasn't his Star Wars, his storyline. It was yeah. Don't even get me started on that. <laughs> It's, it's for a good thing show. Melanie's just in the comment section. She's not on the show. Otherwise, yeah. we can go out for another three hours. You know, the, yeah, people, was... the people who are nervous about Disney+, Plus, they do have a right to, to have a little bit of apprehension because of Star Wars, you know, and, and some of the things that have happened. There's been some good and some bad there. But at the same time, I just have a total faith in Russell because he's had this vision 
of wanting to do this since he brought the show back back in 2005 and he just didn't have the mechanism to create this expanded universe and now he does um, he's, and, he's, on and that, I, he's got the means i mean he doesn't have a college budget he yeah, doesn't have the yeah. bbc public budget he's got sony backing him up disney yep. plus distributing i'm like yeah this but, is where the show should be at this moment I, I think it's going to raise the profile again yes. in ways we probably haven't seen since Matt. You know what? David brought in the girls, we always say, and Matt brought in the kids. And then after that, it's been kind of level. Now, with, with, with Disney eyeballs, there's a brand new generation who are going to go, what is Doctor Who? What is this all about? And Shooty in just the the limited amount of stuff that I've seen him be doctor-ish, not mm -hmm. talking about sex education or any of his previous work, talking about the little video he did where he's explaining Doctor Who. It's only a couple minutes long, but he's the doctor in that. And I'm mesmerized by it. And it, it, the, the Doctor Who just flows out of the man. I'm like, this is the way I felt when Matt was cast, where I'm like, this guy's got energy like I've never felt before. And, and, and it just, it was a breath of fresh air back then. And, and that's the way I feel about Shooty. And the exciting thing about Shooty too, I mean, I, I'm so excited. I'm so excited about Shooty as the doctor and from a creative perspective, that's, I'm, I could talk about that forever. But even before that, if I, if I can speak on behalf of the gay agenda, which I can, and I now will, um, if David brought the girls and Matt brought the kids, Shooty is gonna bring all the queers. And we, I don't think Doctor Who has seen that before. Hannah, I got news for you. They've been here all along. Been, yeah. 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 Little yeah. segment. I, of, I am too. So there's there's this weird segment of straight edge queers who are not nerdy. Yeah, yeah. There are not I, many I, of them. I, 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 them, but they're. I'm not knocking it, but I think ever since John Pertwee wore a, a frilly shirt and a and a velvet jacket and. <laughs> <you know. laughs> And, 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 and who knows? Maybe excited. even before then. Yeah, no, that's, fair. that's fair. I'm hoping. Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping more than that. It's not just. And I'm not dissing the LGB, but I'm hoping Shooty brings everybody to the table. Well, that's the no thing. I think, they... I think the kids are coming in too because one, he's he's very young. He's got mm -hmm. that youthful energy, and and it's on Disney Plus. So there's going to be an exposure, and what will happen is the adults. I think will go. I've heard of that. Even if they've never seen the show, there's a there's a brand recognition. Yes. And they'll go. Let's try that out. Or let me let me dive in. And I've heard a lot of strange things like they need to get the back catalog and blah blah blah. blah. No, they don't need to do any of that right now. What they need to do is put 2023 content on their channel, and leave it alone. Let it grow. Let people discover it. Be, make them be Indiana Jones. Make them go and discover how do I find these things? How do I how do I get into it? If if you throw it all out there, it's gonna seem like holy cow, there's 18 million episodes I have to catch up on. Don't do that. You'll alienate them. I have not watched Supernatural. Because there's 18 million episodes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have I have yet to watch the whole thing myself. I've seen a couple episodes here and there, but yeah, I would say the same reason. And that's it's very interesting. Also, I agree with you, Ken, when you're talking about Disney Plus, because now that I have had the experience of writing for screenwriting and TV now, that one of the things that TV is doing now, and it really has been going on for a couple of years, but really going forward. You're seeing TV series are going to be built more for instead of just a niche type of audience, they are looking for the whole shebang. So anybody, grandma can sit down or grandson can sit down and watch and enjoy Doctor Who. And that's exactly what that, that whole is. So because of that, I think Doctor Who is going to be getting more popular than already ever has. And we'll be yeah. seeing the spinoffs that uh, Russell's been wanting to do too. Oh, uh, Dave, just in case, Bob Iger? It's time for a Doctor Who attraction somewhere in Walt Disney World. It's time. You can create a land. I don't care. You can put bubble beer in it. I well, whatever the heck that stuff is. That butter oh, beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. Make that. I'm making that stuff up. But it's time for Gallifrey and land. It's time for you know some fun stuff. It's time for a dark ride and get all the doctors out there. Hey, 
build a hotel. Well, let me, let me ask you, right? <laughs> if, if, the, if the choice was Doctor Who Land at Disney or Paul McGann series, what would you take? You hurt me, Ken. You really hurt I me. Really <laughs> deeply. That's easy. Paul McGann, because I'm McGann, no yeah. big, big That's partner. right. Oh, would you like to take a pinky, Mr. Iger? No problem. You know. <laughs> yeah. I I, I think <laughs> I think at some point it's gonna be almost like a um like a televised big finish. Yes. Uh, and, and not, too. not quickly, and you don't want it to be quickly. You want it to grow naturally. You want to be patient and wait wait for good things to happen. I'm a, I'm a little disappointed. Like, well, we're going to do a Dalek spinoff and a, and a, and a Cyberman spinoff. Neat, but can we get Paul McGann first? Yeah. 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 I, I, as far as I'm, my understanding is that that hasn't actually been confirmed. It's just been a rumor at this point that that is yeah. what. The, but the Daleks, the Daleks on their own, yeah. okay. honestly, I probably don't excite anybody. Yeah. They, 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 the way the doctor needs them to be exciting, they need the doctor to be exciting. Otherwise, they're just running around angry at everybody. And that we got their know. two movies. Yeah, technically. Yeah. And and uh, Doctor Who's technically Marvel. Yeah. Just saying. <laughs> oh, the technicalities that we. Can oh, the, the, yeah, exactly. And 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 who in Doctor Who now are technically Disney princesses? Oh no, Missy. I mean, Rose. Yeah, that's what I would have said. Rose, right off the bat. Oh my god, we just gonna this, go. This is a little more. Really cool. Cool. Like, like, that the new uh, that Millie will be as well. I that uh, Ruby, the character Ruby, that will be a princess yeah. as well. Well, Leela's a Disney princess. Send her over to Avatar Land and literally screw things <laughs> up. <laughs> that that I would pay money for. <laughs> <laughs> that I would actually see the the way of water, whatever that that movie that's coming up over there. So, yeah, <laughs> Melanie saying Martha is now a Disney. Every every uh, girl companion is now a that's Disney right. princess. Yeah, Donna Noble. Yes, Donna. Yes, Donna Noble is a princess. <laughs> she, would just, she would take her wand and just beat the hell out of people. <laughs> yeah, that's Ace. Yes. <laughs> no, she's got the Nitro Nine. <laughs> she, yeah. She'll throw that at people. Uh, within 20 years, McGann will become last living classic era doctor. And you know what? I don't know. I've always thought about if they should recast doctors or if they should deep fake them. Mm. That's always been a challenge. I, I, yeah, I think I think a deep fake is for something cameo related. Yeah. It's, it's something if you, if you're only going to use it for a minute and it's the you know if 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 the only way to get Roger Delgado on a, on the screen for a special moment is mm -hmm. to deep fake it that's fine if he only has to deliver like a single you know a line for a for a moment but if you're going to do that to bring the character back to life it it it, it doesn't work for me I I actually get taken out of it um you know the difference between Carrie Fisher and uh, uh, and and Peter Cushing in Rogue One. One is in it f for a lot of the time, and one is in it for a cameo. And you can handle the cameo. It's tough when you're trying to bring the character back to life. Uh, as much as Guy Henry tried, and you know they they used a lot of amazing techniques, but it, it it's still the I I find myself the whole time kind of staring at it like. Like you're gonna find the, you know, find the flaw in it. Mm -hmm. Hannah, would you uh, would you uh, recast or would you fake it? That didn't come out right. At all. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> not fake it. Um, no, it's I um no, but but also that holds true. I think I think I agree with um with everything Ken's saying. Where it's there's and it's I mean my fir my first love was theater. My first love was directing live theater. And I think there's something about just the magic of that interaction, you know, like effects can only get, get you so far. Mm -hmm. And certainly like if the point is the visual or the point is everybody remembers they said this one line and it sounded that way, right? Mm -hmm. Like if the recording can get you there, 
uh, yeah. then, then use it by all means. But what is actually going to serve the spirit of the piece, right? And, and you know, one of the, the comments was just about David Bradley, who I adore and was fantastic. And, and after a few minutes, you're pulled into the performance. You're not supposed to forget William Hartnell. You're really, you're, you're watching the first doctor. You're not watching William Hartnell. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like Sean Pertwee, if he played the third doctor, yeah, he kind of has yes. a bit of his father's characteristics, but you actually want him to be Sean Pertwee because he's freaking amazing. Yes. So you want it to be, you want the flavor to be there without it being, um, you know, uh, um, a copycat, uh, you know, yeah. a, a, um, a clone of the a clone doctor. of it. Yeah, absolutely. You, you and that's what. David Bradley does as, as the first doctor. He's he's not trying to be every little nuance of William Hartnell. He's doing his own thing because right. David Bradley's pretty damn good on his own. Mm -hmm. So, so here's a question for you. Like, like, coming from the same kind of thing, Reese Searsmith as as Troughton's doctor, would you bring him in in the same way that we brought, you know, that we got Bradley? Or would you recast that with someone else? Maybe one of Troughton's grandkids or something, because there's a bunch of actors in that family, <laughs> <laughs> and most of them don't look anything like Patrick Troughton. No, yeah. and either, no. Just, no, that was the thing. Like that was the only casting in that entire docudrama that I did not like was him. But and would would you bring him in, or would you get get someone else? I, I think you could. I think we haven't really explored a second Doctor casting, so there may be somebody out there. You know, and 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 it's weird with Big Finish; they're going for vocal tones. Yeah. They're not looking for the aspect. So you know, they've re recast Doctors in Big Finish, but they're going based on on sonic needs, not on visual needs. Yeah. Um, you know, when when you're when you're thinking television, it's it's a whole different animal. And yeah, yeah, I, I I'm not against it. Because it's really the only way we're going to keep this alive. It, 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 it's not like the show is ten years old. The show is sixty years old. And I don't know. I don't mind Sadie taking over for her mother. Yeah, yeah. She's got uh, the she's voice and the mannerism. Or if if worse comes to worse, a descendant of. We're going to have to figure out who the daddy is. But <laughs> it's just like exactly. Um, folks, we are slightly coming over to the end of our show, so I do want to include our discussion. Mm -hmm. Ken, if you want to talk about the Ooh. August 18th through the 20th, 2000. Yeah, our dates moved. Uh, L.I. Who for the 60th anniversary will be August 18th and 20th. We're back to a three day show in honor of the 60th anniversary. It's a summertime event. And uh, and then uh, and then the book is out too, which we're seeing pictures of, and, and the Doctor and Ace apparently enjoying it. There's and Matthew. Matthew and Vanessa as well. And some of this, uh, the book is Doctor Who. It's the um, a world of demons, the villains of Doctor Who. It features sixteen mm. authors. Uh, it's available now from Fayetteville Mafia Press in both the U.S. and mm. in the U.K. from all reputable and a few non-reputable booksellers. And uh, it has contributions by Hannah Friedman and Ken Deep. We do have, if you are watching this after the live feed, we do have the link in the description on YouTube as well as Facebook and also in the chat as well if you want to check it out. I'll go ahead and repost that. Uh, folks, if you are still looking for <clears throat> your holiday treat, uh, you can check back to our Thanksgiving foodie special that we had for 2022. Don't forget to watch that episode. That was a cool episode where you got to watch all of our panelists live in front of you cook their favorite geek recipes in front, including Dave. I think uh, Jessica was on there. and She was making her balls. <laughs> I forgot her balls. That was just the running gag of the whole thing show that she dropped her balls all over the place <laughs> and um you, you got to see it ken <laughs> it's really Bolton jokes the entire time which was very weird <laughs> exactly and uh we wanted to give special thanks to our friends uh jake estrada and everybody at krampus con this past weekend uh you, if you got lucky you got to see ren with his uh, uh his santa hat and the krampus and um we're still running all throughout the 25th of december on our facebook page <clears throat> 
on our Facebook page. Um, Dave, I do see a picture that's been added. Do you want to talk to us about that? Yes, when my, in my, uh, I'll just back up. So sure. I've got Go my big interview here tomorrow. Uh, you saw the commercial, if you were around earlier for that, uh, talking to Jerry <laughs> Simpson, which is going to be amazing. But uh, I also said there will be a giveaway, and that has been posted up for the last uh, week and a bit. So if you go to uh, to my link tree, uh, linktr dot ee slash the rat dot ca, you can enter to uh, get a copy of Kringle Crisis. At oh. that's yeah, we moved it. We, we switched it to the that. There might be oh, okay. version of that. Um, but yeah, the uh, you, you could win a copy of Kringle Crisis. You can also play along uh, for our fabulous guest. Uh, Kringle Crisis is personally, it is a analog version of uh, the, those old computer text parser games. So Zork and, and Wizardry and all mm -hmm. that. So Jared will be taking the uh, role of the parser of the computer. And uh, a few of us have got uh, Nisha is coming on. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, I've got Caitlin, who does a bunch of reviews for me uh, on Looney Labs and Pyramids, and Andrew Looney coming in from Looney Labs, uh, who's a very big fan of, of that. So please join in uh, same time tomorrow uh, over on my my channel. Gotcha. And uh, as we wrap it up, Hannah, where could people find you, follow you, unlike Ken with Mackenzie at his house? <laughs> <laughs> Where can people follow you and follow your good works that you're going to be starting to write? Now, this uh, is your first attempt. Yeah. So the best place right. to find me for now is um, Hanecdotes on Instagram. So it's H-A-N-N-A-H, Kadotes. Um, and, um, or you can look at my website, which is just khannafriedman.com. Um, but Instagram has my more recent stuff, I think. Gotcha. Ken? Where can people stalk you? <laughs> well, I'm usually outside of uh, Mackenzie's house. With there Matt. we go. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm at Ken Deep just about everywhere. And uh, LongIslandDoctorWho.com is the all spelled out. LongIslandDoctorWho.com is the uh, website for the for the convention. And uh, I also want to say thank you for for having us and. Um, and right, giving pleasure. us all this time and, and, and actually just coming up with great conversation. This has really been a lot of fun. Oh, we could have cut further because the all next right. question, I, I wanted to tell you this, and I was actually going to ask it, but I was going to think that we were going to run for like another three hours, Yeah, which is what you brought up earlier, is the doctor good and evil or good or evil? And we actually bring that question up to the panel. And that usually, they book us for like a 45 minute. We're usually in there for 90 <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and it keeps going. They won't stop. It's just like I will throw something out there, but I will give you. I will give you a little bit of a taste. And I said, okay, because one of the questions is, what is what do you define a hero or a villain? Uh, by Mackenzie's blackout. <laughs> 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 that too. Hopefully, we'll see. Yes, we'll hopefully see you in Li Who. But the question, the panel, that we out, it's only about an eighteen-hour drive from Orlando. It, it's a quick jaunt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I just uh, you, if I just stop at the McDonald's for that, you know that super duper <laughs> thing of latte or whatever that stuff is. Each we're through Tampa, yeah. we'll pick up Melanie, and don't and don't pee anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I can make it out there. Uh, I want to thank uh, especially Hannah Friedman and Ken Deep from uh, Eli Who uh, guys. And, and again, if you want to purchase their book, it's inside the description as well as in the chat link. What happened to Ken? <laughs> <laughs> He's gone. He's, He's gone. We weren't done yet, dude. <laughs> Was it something I said? Probably. I don't know what's going on. With technical issues, we're going to end with technical issues. There you go. Yeah. Well, and yeah. if you're back there, um, we're, we're, we'll go ahead and end the show, but uh, come back into the link. I just had a few questions for you. Uh, folks, thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to say goodbye again. Please stay safe out there. If you need help, uh, please let these folks know. I'm going to put it up in just a second there. Please, 800-273-TALK eight, or 8255 for talk or text 988 uh, for hotline. If you just need to reach out to somebody for help, please, by all means, contact these people. I, I know he just sent me a PM. <laughs> he just PM me on Facebook said, I just dropped. I said, get back in here. Just <laughs> back in here. Why would you just get back in here? Anyway, uh, just uh, don't forget to say goodbye on the way out so we can catch you in the uh, in the chats. And uh, yeah, we'll get that in just a second there. Oh, there. Wait a minute. Oh. 
Got, okay, got, wait a minute. Just people are showing up now. There we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, 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 there we go. There's Melanie. Oh my God, really good good <laughs> night in the day she shows up. Well, I like kept being in the chat, so. No, I appreciate it, but we want to see your face. We want to see you. I there. figured com comedic wise, when he dropped out, I'm like, oh, I could try getting in it now. <laughs> <laughs> Part of me didn't show, so you're fine. Anyway, thanks for coming up on the end of the show. <laughs> Uh, don't forget to check out uh, uh, Melanie on Instagram, uh, Pieces of Melee. And she does her live uh, shows. You can check her while she's building. What were you building earlier? Uh, we're working on a stained glass for... Um, okay, I'll try to do this as quickly as possible. Uh, on Instagram, there is a, my Star Wars-y community. Uh, somebody called At Hondo Supply. They, once every year, they do an ornaments project where a bunch of people make ornaments decorate ornaments and they send it to him everybody bids on them and he picks a charity to go for last year was magic wheelchair this year is mission 22 which is supporting us uh, veterans in uh, the fight against uh, the suicide rates of veterans oh, okay. um so i was building a stained glass ornament because i work in stained glass at my full-time job so we were making a couple stained glass ornaments shipping them out but that starts december 11th again hondo supply is uh, on Instagram, and that's when it's going to start December 11th to bid and get money for help helping those vets. Oh. <laughs> and that's a period on the end of that sentence. <laughs> for next week, fingers crossed, we're hoping to have our friends at Who North America so you can see what fabulous merchandise is out there for Doctor Who, especially in their store, uh, to bring them on and show us it's for your holidays. If you're looking for that last-minute item, for your favorite Whovian, why not check out this next episode? You get to see live from inside their store, soldering stained glass Star Wars stuff with lead-free solder. Mm. Yeah, I was using lead-free specifically because it's a, a Christmas ornament. In uh, the stained glass industry, you usually use 60-40 so, uh, solder because it does contain lead, but that's because it, it's you're not going to go up to a window and hopefully touch it and lick it, hopefully. But an ornament, kids can, puppies can, dogs can, you know that, using lead-free solder for Ken these ornaments will. as well. I, 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 <laughs> I mean, Mackenzie, I'll make you some windows. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me what you need. <laughs> All right, everybody, please stay safe. Continue to become part of the legend. Thank you so much for coming. Tony, take us out. Have a great night, folks. Happy holidays. <laughs>